last week. I always like hearing him. Uh, Karen and I had a wonderful time visiting my parents. Uh, did to minister to them just a little bit, take care of some things for them. Uh, and so I'm glad to be back, and what a great Sunday to be back on Easter Sunday to celebrate the resurrection with you. We have been going through the Gospel of John, and for the last month, as we've gone through John chapters 6 and 7, we've seen Jesus doing uh, miraculous, mighty works, healing people, feeding the crowds, uh, ministering in different ways. And over and over again, while he's doing those things, people are saying, show us a sign. Show us something to prove who you are, as if he hadn't done anything. Well, I didn't want to proceed on in John today, but I did want to go to Luke, where in that same circumstance, where he's doing these things and works, people are saying, demanding a sign from him. Uh, he tells them, here's, here's your sign. Here's the sign you're going to get. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 11 this morning and begin with verses 29 and 30. If you have your Bible, I'd ask you to turn to that with me. Uh, if you don't, you can read it up there on the screen. Luke chapter 11, verses 29 and 30. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. Let's pray. Father, open our eyes to the words of Jesus. Open our hearts to receive what he spoke. Teach us, Lord, and then send us from this place, carrying your word to a lost world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The wicked generation that asks for a sign, no sign will be given except for the sign of Jonah. Hmm. Well, there's a lot going on here. Jesus said it's a wicked generation that seeks a sign. Now, you have to understand, throughout the Old Testament, God never said, don't ask for a sign. Uh, uh, Jason, who asked for the police? Gideon, thank you. I'm, I'm in the Greek territory. Gideon asked for the police, and God gave it to him. And then when Gideon said, can I have something else? God did that without rebuke, without challenging him. And you see that several times through the Old Testament where some Hezekiah, how will I know that God's going to let me live 15 more years? Well, what, what sign would you like? Okay, I'd like this one. And yet, when it comes down to this point, when Jesus is doing his ministering, he rebukes them. But the point is, it's not because they're doing like Gideon or like Hezekiah, saying, God, I believe, what do you, show me something that I can trust you with. It's not that. He's already healed people. He's already fed the 5,000. He's walked on water. He's done these miraculous, mighty works. And they look at that and go, yeah, not enough. Uh, so show me something else. As if his job is just to put on a show for them. The prophets did mighty works. Moses did mighty works. Jesus did mighty works. And yet... Even though Moses had a lot of friction with people over his leadership, they didn't all turn away from him and go, nah, he must not be God's man. The prophets had a lot of friction, especially with the kings. And the kings, even Ahab, would go back to the prophets and ask for what God wanted. But when Jesus comes along and does these mighty works, they look at him and go, eh, it's not enough. Show me another sign. You might think it's a little bit harsh for Jesus to say it's a wicked generation that asks for a sign. But in fact, that's based on the evidence of everything that he's already done. Belief is a choice. It's not something that is forced upon you. For instance, you've heard people say, if we could just go up to Mount Ararat, 
and find Noah's Ark, then people would have to believe. No, they wouldn't. Belief is a choice. You look at it and you go, yeah, I, I'll bet that's some monastery that some monks in the Middle Ages built. They look like Noah's Ark. I mean, if you don't want to believe, you can always find it. Jesus filled those pots with water and it tasted like wine. I bet they stored wine in those pots at some other time. And so when you put the water in it, well, it had a little bit of wine taste. If you don't choose to believe, you can always find a way out. No, nah, I don't believe it. Most folks choose to disbelieve. I'm not gullible. I, I'm not going to fall for that. And so Jesus proclaims, they want a sign? Here's your sign. One great sign will be given to that unbelieving generation. The sign would be widely known. And the sign is the picture of Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of a, free, of a fish for three days and then came out again. And he did a ministry that God had for him. That sign still stands today. Now, Dr. Kate, my Old Testament professor at seminary, said that when he was a pastor, uh, one time on Sunday morning during Sunday school, he wandered through the classes listening to the different teachers, and the lesson that morning was on Jonah. And he said, I went into one classroom, and one guy was teaching it completely rationally. There's no, it wasn't really a great fish, or it wasn't this, it wasn't that. But he was still teaching about Jonah being dead for three days and alive again. And he went to another classroom, and here was a man directly teaching exactly what it says. Jonah was swallowed by a great fish and spit up again after three days. And he said, the fact is, whether they approached it either way, they were both teaching what happened to Jonah. God always is glorified even when we mess it up. Because God always calls glory to himself. And so the sign of Jonah stands today. He was dead, as good as dead. I mean, I mean there, are, there are evidences of uh, sailors off a whaling ship being swallowed, not by whales, but by sharks. And my favorite one is, uh, this one sailor fell overboard and he was immediately swallowed by a large shark. And so the captain had a cannon fired at the shark. And the cannonball hit the shark and barfed the guy back up. And he was okay. I, I like that story. That's one of my favorites. The guy's as good as dead. I mean, if you watch Jaws, you know what happened. Crunch. Oh, he's gone. You don't go, oh, maybe he'll come back out. <laughs> he's gone. He's fish food. Uh, and yet, miraculously, Jonah then is there standing on the beach walking up, going to Nineveh, and preaching God's word to them, that is an amazing sign. And Jesus said, you want a sign? The only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. Why Jonah? He's the sign of resurrection. He's the picture of resurrection. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the earth. And then you'll see him again. He'll be alive. Three days, get it? That, that's the picture. Well, what, what's this about the three days? What, why is that so important? Well, it's interesting because at, at the third day of a dead person, well, you're kind of uh, deteriorating. Remember when the, Jesus came and he waited three days and then he came, so it was four days when Jesus got to where Lazarus' tomb was and he says, open the tomb. And his sister says, Lord, he, he's been in there a while. He's going to stink. Or as the King James Version puts it, he's stinking. <laughs> yeah, people die and they deteriorate. And so, once a person has started that decaying process, wouldn't it be kind of cool for God to raise him from the dead? Walk around smelling the rest of your life? <laughs> that was the thought. That was the thought. That was the way they were thinking about it. And so, the fact that it was three days was supposed to be evidence that he was not mostly dead, <laughs> but really dead. Stinky dead. That's the point of it. 
so that it was proof that he was dead. Jesus' resurrection is not an accoutrement to Christianity. It's not a, a, a nice little story to tell, you know, to add to the healings and the feeding the 5,000 and the walking on the water. It's, it's not an extra story. It's the point of Christianity. If Jesus had not died, been buried for three days, and rose again from the dead, conquering death, Christianity has no foundation. If archaeologists unearth some tomb that says Joseph of Arimathea on it, and they go inside and they find a body with a placard that says Jesus of Nazareth on it, if they were to do that, there's no Christianity. If they were to absolutely, positively identify a body in a grave as Jesus, then there's no Christianity. But they have not been able to do that because there isn't one. He didn't... I remember preaching on the resurrection in seminary in a class in preaching, and the professor, and I said that we know Christ rose, and the professor critiqued me, and he said, now you don't want to say we know. And I said, yes, we do. I may just be a student. I may not have a PhD. But if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, I'm going to go back to building cabinets. Why would I, why would I waste my time being a preacher if it's just, are we spiritually rose? That's not, that's not rising. That's not conquering death. Jesus' resurrection is a sign for unbelievers. Many people saw, many people believed, but many people did not believe because seeing is not necessarily believing. Belief is a choice. That's why it's called faith, by the way. To look at something and say, I may not understand it, I may have some doubts about it, but I'm going to trust God. That's what It takes three English words to translate the Greek word pestuo for faith. It's believe, faith, and trust. And so as you're reading the New Testament, you'll come across those words, believe, faith, and trust, and they may look like different things, but they're all the same word in Greek. You're supposed to trust God that he's not lying to you. You're supposed to believe God that he really did this. And you're supposed to have faith in God that he's not going to leave you hanging. That's what's going on. That's what's of choice. To trust God, to believe God, to have faith in God. Jesus rose from the power of, the, of, the, of death. And scripture says that death is the last enemy to be conquered. Jesus conquered that, promising that one day you and I will be conquered. We'll have death conquered in our life and we will stand in eternal life. Stinks after three days? Hello, ever hear the power of God? What's impossible for God? Verse 31. Jesus goes on after he says, only one sign given, the sign of Jonah. He goes on and tells a couple of stories. The first one is this. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. Queen of the South, the Queen of Sheba. Queen of Sheba made a state visit to Israel. She came to bask in Solomon's great wisdom. Now you may, that may just sound like, oh yeah, okay, fine, another Bible story. You need to understand that at that time in the ancient Near East, wisdom, things that you and I take for granted, stitch in time, save nine. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Stuff like that. Those are actually nuggets of wisdom. We just you, Your mom gave them to you when you were growing up. But these were being developed at this time. And wisdom was highly exalted among the peoples of the ancient Near East at this time. They were thinking about life and discovering things and putting them into these little pithy sayings to make your life easier. Solomon spoke many, many uh, proverbs, and so the Queen of Sheba wanted to come and hear him. 
that she probably stopped off in Egypt on the way and listened to what was going on there too. She could have gone on to Babylon and heard the wisdom that was going because it was a worldwide phenomenon at this time. And Solomon had a great name with wisdom. So she made this state visit. She went to Israel to bask in Solomon's great wisdom. Now, this journey was not, she didn't hop on a plane and fly a couple of hours and then get off in a secure airport uh, with the Israeli Secret Service watching everything. No. It was a journey fraught with peril, with danger, with hardship. It took a long time. It was, some of it might have been by ship. A lot of it would have been by camel or by horse. It was hot and there was no air conditioning. There were sicknesses and diseases and you had to worry about water and you had to bring your own food. That was a hard trip, but she felt that the peril was worth it to go and hear Solomon. Think of the value she placed on wisdom to make that trip to go hear him. Well, Jesus said that woman will stand as a witness for the prosecution on the day of judgment. She will stand and condemn this generation because you, unless you're more spiritual than I thought, you've never sat down and talked with Jesus physically, face to face. You've never had Jesus touch you and heal you of what you were dealing with. You've never had Jesus comfort you when you were in agony and pain and suffering. You've done it spiritually, but you've never had his physical presence. And many of these people, that generation, had. Personally, they'd seen it. And that's why Jesus said the Queen of the South is going to rise in judgment against this generation. They saw it. They were there. They experienced it. She made her journey based on nothing but faith. All she knew about Solomon was hearsay. But she made that journey. She felt the peril was worth it to better herself and to learn that wisdom that she had. And she will stand that day on judgment and condemn the hard-hearted because they had it and they tossed it away. Solomon was the greatest king of ancient Israel, and yet, Jesus said, someone greater than Solomon is here today. Because Jesus is not just a great teacher. He's not just a compassionate leader showing us you know, how we should love one another and let's all get along. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. God himself chose to be born of a woman. He spent nine months in Mary's belly. He was born that process. He was spent a couple of years wrapped in swaddling clothes so he could barely move taken care of, fed, cleaned up, that disgusting process. Lived as a child, went through the childhood diseases like you and I go through. Went as a young boy, had to go to school, had to learn. God had to sit through all that boring stuff. He knows it all. He did it. Became a teenager. Jesus was willing to have acne for you. He was a teenager. He learned a trade. He worked at that trade probably for close to 20 years before he then stood up and put on his rabbinic robe and began his ministry. He felt, now this is, I'm trying to tell you this, it wasn't God going, you know, I think we need a sacrifice for people and so I'm going to put on a man suit and go walk around and, you know, and then when, when bullets bounce and shoot me, I'll just, da da and they'll bounce off. He was completely human. He went through all the things you and I go through. No one will be able to stand on the judgment day and say, you don't know what my life was like. Because he does. He lived it. He was one of us. Jesus is Emmanuel. God with us. Imagine you're sitting there breaking bread with this guy, and he's God. People who met him 
knew it on one level or another. Even the people who disagreed with him recognized he was a completely different man. The soldiers that they sent to arrest him came back empty-handed and said, nobody talked like this guy. Well, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. I worked with the sheriff's department. The deputies don't ever come back after being sent out to serve a warrant, arrest somebody, and go, I'm sorry, we didn't arrest him because nobody talks like him. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Jesus is a completely different kind of person. He is a God man. He's not sort of God. He's not sort of man. He's God and man. How does he do that? I'll be sure and ask him when I get to heaven. But that is a statement of faith. He is the God man. He is completely different. Here's your son. Verse 32. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. You need to understand something. That was another wicked generation. Nineveh, you may only know it from the story of Jonah. Okay, Jonah went to talk to the city and tell everybody and they repented. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, the Assyrian Empire. And at the time when God told Jonah to go preach to them, they were assaulting and attacking Israel, Jonah's land. And God said, I want you to go and speak to them. And Jonah said, I don't want to do that because I know you're a forgiving God. And if I go and preach to them and they repent, you'll forgive them. And personally, I'd rather you destroy them. I mean, think about it. Jonah, go and talk to the people who are who are terrorizing and destroying your people so that I can forgive them. What? No, I don't want that. I want the destroy part. So, how could Jonah, when he finally, you know, came up out of the fish, how can he be assigned to the Ninevites? Well, why is he different from just any other person? Well, actually, it's pretty good stage management. Imagine how Jonah looked after spending three days inside a great fish. Think about it. His skin is bleached white from the gastric juices in the fish's gut. His clothes, which a lot of times in those days were, were uh, plant-based, flaxen, uh, are half-digested. He's got a half-chewed piece of seaweed stuck right here. And he walks up to an Ninevite and says, Repent. Whoa, this guy is different. He is a sign, and they look at him, and they recognize it. Nobody beat him up. Nobody arrested him. Nobody assaulted him. They listened, and Nineveh repented after three days. Ninevites, pagans, not, not Jewish people, not people raised with God's word. Absolute, unbelieving pagans turned and repented because Jonah said, at the word of Yahweh, this city is going to be destroyed in three days. So they heard and they believed in faith. That's what I'm talking about. They trusted. They, ex they accepted it. They believed it. But not us. Not the people of the generation Jesus is talking about. And certainly not our generation. Oh, we're, we're way too sophisticated to fall for that religious hocus pocus malarkey stuff. Everybody knows the Bible's been disproved. Let me help you out here. No, it hasn't. As a matter of fact, historically, we're learning more and more about how the Bible is corroborated by the things that we find. But the fact is, you can have all the science in the world and you cannot disprove God. Belief is a choice. You either believe or you don't believe. But either of those, by the way, law of science and you have faith. No, it doesn't work that way. Because everything you know is based on faith. No, that's not true. I'm a scientist. I have proof. No, that's not true. Because of this. How do you know that what your eyes see and what your brain tells you is information? 
Now you may think, yeah, come on. No, in fact, take a philosophy class. Because that's the first thing they will assault. How do you know that what you think is actually real information and is not just a hallucination? And it's not just insanity? And you're just sitting in a corner in a rubber room somewhere and you just think all this stuff is. How do you know you're not in the matrix? How do you know? And here is the only answer that works and that makes science possible. I am going to choose to believe that what I see is reality. And so based on that, I can put this substance and this substance together and something happens, and if I do it again, it'll happen again. That's how you do science. But if you go, well, I think if I put these things together and this happens, it might not happen next time because, you know, I don't know if it's real. You can't have science that way. And so both science and faith are based on faith. That you're trusting what you see to be accurate, to be true. Without that trust, you can't have any knowledge. You can't have any information. You can't have any hope that what you're thinking is real. And so, the message is the same today. Believe and repent. The Queen of Sheba went on faith. The people of Nineveh turned and repented on faith. The same in message is today. Believe and repent. Something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. He died for our sins. He was buried in the earth for three days. He rose again, conquering death on your behalf. He offers you forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And I will tell you personally, my life has been completely overturned because I trusted and gave my life to you. I offer that to you. Here's your sign. Let's pray. Father, may your word speak to our hearts. May the truth of what you say touch us and help us to know you. And may your spirit infuse us and strengthen us that we might live for you. Send us from this place with your love today. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise team, come on up.